So, um, our next speaker is uh, Jim McWilliams. Uh, Jim is uh, among a handful of the leading geophysical fluid dynamicists of his uh, generation. And um, I did some work with Jim and uh, Peter Sullivan at uh, NCAR uh, starting in the early 2000s. Um, Working with um, Fabrice, we had done some laboratory experiments on, on breaking waves here um, that were an improvement on some of the aspects of experiments we'd done previously. And we'd also started uh, with uh, Peter Matusov, who is somewhere here in the audience. Um, there's Peter. Um, we had also started doing some uh, airborne oceanography uh, doing imagery of, of breaking waves in the field to measure the statistics of breaking. And um, I think it was Jim that recognized that this might be an opportunity to start looking at some modeling uh, that he, uh, he and Peter uh, could do uh, numerically. And so uh, in the early 2000s we started working on this, taking taking, using the laboratory data to help form a model of an individual breaking wave, and then uh, also using the statistics that we've measured from the airborne work uh, to put that in a, a statistical model of the ocean, upper ocean. Uh, so there are two papers that came out of that. One was a direct numerical simulation of these individual uh, breaking events. Um, and the other one was putting that into the into more complex, um, <coughs> excuse me, statistical model of the uh, of the upper ocean. So that was a lot of uh, a lot of work, uh, mainly on, mainly on Peter Sullivan's part. I think the complexity, the complexity of the modeling, um, was really quite difficult. And in some sense, I think Jim and I were standing on the sidelines while Peter did most of the work. Um, but the, the initial ideas were a, were a collective effort and I think it was, it was productive and given the improvements we've made in our airborne measurements, uh, actually somebody in my group, I think it might have been Luke, said that it was perhaps time to go back and look at that modeling again with better, with better uh, measurements to compare it with. So uh, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to welcome Jim and I'm delighted that you are here. Thank you, Ken. I'll make some general remarks about the state of this science and then focus on a few particular stories, um, some of which have been with Ken. I think our paper count is six, not two. Um, and um, Peter Sullivan would have liked to have been here, but he couldn't. Peter is a long time computational partner of mine, and we have worked together on these collaborative papers with Ken. Um, I'm of course glad to be here in the context of, of talking about this, but also Ken and I are of an age, and some would say we're even of an appearance. <laughs> <coughs> we both had youthful beards that we wisely abandoned. And I abandoned useful mustaches. <laughs> um, just to set a context, um, surface gravity waves is an ancient scientific subject. Um, and sort of for fun, I just decided to think of a few seminal characters and, and grabbed all the from papers. Um, Kelvin, of course, did many things, but he, he was in there very early. In looking at this particular paper, I read the end notes and was so struck by the difference of tone of professional discourse between then and now that I decided to copy it out and let you read it. 
Um, Longan Higgins was a giant. Um, he spent a lot of time here at Scripps. Um, Stoker is a, another example of, of essentially the mathematical side of this field. And the last one I list, because he wrote an absolutely wonderful book. Um, I was an undergraduate in mathematics, and this was the first physics book I ever read. It was very enticing. Um, evidently had an effect. Um, in large measure because of um, the style of the book, which is delightful. So in fact, in preparing this talk, I went and checked out a copy from the library. I had to blow off a lot of dust but started reading again and, and was re-enchanted. It also is approximately a picture of the field at the time of waves, at the time that, that Ken got started. Now, more cogently for um, this topic, let's talk about waves with currents, sort of starting with the framework of, of wave generation and dissipation, um, there are propositions that are almost manifestos, they're not entirely true, but they're so much almost true that they're the right framework, that wave generation is by form stress, pressure forces over the safe face of the waveforms. Um, and this, from an atmospheric perspective, is called surface drag. Um, but it's, and it's often represented as if it's a turbulent drag, and it isn't. Um, and the other side is that wave dissipation is primarily through um, individual impulses of, of breaking waves that carry momentum and energy into the ocean, into the currents. And this is, is often referred to as wind stress, again, as if it's a, a mean quantity that can be related to the mean current profile. Um, and in fact, the standard representations of, of atmosphere to ocean exchange are through bulk drag formulas, dependent on, on the velocity difference between air and water, and usually even forgetting the ocean current contribution to that, which is a mistake. And to the extent that waves are represented, then, then they are just something hidden in the drag coefficient, but probably not really very well. Um, I mean, well hidden, but not very well represented. And the actual processes are these detailed things involving the, the shape of the waves. Um, a very useful concept in this whole subject has been the concept of wind wave equilibrium, in which the wind is statistically steady long enough that your, your generation balances your dissipation, sort of averaged over a, a certain area in time, and that there's a term called wave age, which is approximately the ratio of the phase speed of the peak of the wave spectrum to the um, atmospheric wind at, at some, what is often called an anemometer height, uh, 10 meters is a traditional height, um, which of course can be related to other levels by Mooney-Nobikoff similarity, um, and the drag coefficient is related to the surface roughness and, and all that kind of phenomenology, semi-empirical phenomenology. Um, the present state of the wave modeling field is that essentially the operational models, uh, spectral models um, averaged over wave phases, um, have sort of taken over wave average models. Klaus Hasselmann was, was sort of the, the progenitor of, of this. And it has, I think, become a kind of black box, um, somewhat to the detriment of the actual science about the processes. Um, but these lands provide the, the input in, in common usage for ocean atmospheric boundary layers above and below. Um, but I think there's some real, well, let's say, interest in the question of what effect the currents have on the waves, abbreviation Q, and how well is that represented in these wave models. It's essentially present as a Doppler shifting in the formula in the bottom uh, 
line. Um, and of course, there are sort of very serious practical questions about what is this surface velocity. Um, um, questions of vertical shear in, the, in the, the, the waves are sort of very difficult to handle theoretically. Um, I'll make a remark here to set up a remark later that, that in fact, if you think of wave theories as growing out of asymptotic expansions and small wave slope, then this is really quite a low order result. And when we get to the counterpart theory of the effects of waves on currents, which I'll call WEC, um, in fact, you have to go to much higher order in those theories to properly get the, the wave current interaction in order to see what the real effect of the waves are. And so there's this kind of incompatibility between the wave view of wave current interaction and the current view. Um, nevertheless, it is essentially the, uh, the state of the art. Um, so, now let's go to the first major topic, which is wind over waves. This is the, uh, you know, homage to Scripps, the picture of Flip. Um, I don't know how many hours Ken has spent on Flip. It does seem to me that most of his recent activities have been trying to develop measurement techniques that will keep him off Flip. <laughs> um, um, but it certainly has, has been a primary platform in, in, in this subject. Um, and in particular, there was a large Navy experiment called the High Resolution Experiment of the last several years, focused on trying to say what is the nature of the airflow, what is, what is the true shape of the, of the surface wave field, how predictable is it, the answer is not very, um, in a detailed way, and what is the airflow over that wave field, uh, which is what I want to talk about here. And I think the, the, the important starting idea is what we call wave pumped wave winds. And it's simply a posing in which you assume there is a wiggly surface that is moving underneath the atmosphere, sort of independent of the state of the atmosphere, because from the leading order of the waves are their own dynamics. Um, and then there's wind above. And if you assume that that wind is uniform, then they're very simple normal mode solutions. I've even written them down here. And they imply certain uh, phases and vertical structures of the winds and pressure field in the atmosphere. Um, in particular, they have no correlation of momentum flux or, or, or form stress, which is the, the middle line, meaning there is no net interaction um, in, in terms of, of momentum flux exchange between the air and the water. And very interestingly, the sign of these phase relations shifts with the, the difference between the phase speed of the wave and the speed of the atmosphere. So C minus U is a very important quantity. The next step, which has been alluded to before, is, is the so-called miles Phillip theory, which was to redo the problem uh, with a um, vertically varying atmospheric wind increasing upward. And in that case, you get unstable amplifying modes, um, and they imply transfer of momentum and energy from the atmosphere to the, to the waves, the waves grow, and there's a very important critical error in which the, the, the wind is equal to, to the phase speed of the, of the wave mode you're looking at. Now, since that sort of early time from a computational simulation point of view, there have been a lot of techniques that apply, um, getting certain pictures of the airflow of the waves. Um, the ones that I think have really brought us forward are what are called large eddy simulations, which is resolved turbulent flows with various parameterizations of the small scale components. Um, and in particular, I'm going to talk about results by this technique. And it's important that there's a model coordinate that is essentially height above the moving surface. The surface is specified, again, taking the point of view that the waves for a short time period mostly go their own way, independent of the state of the atmosphere. And furthermore, if you're going to make good dynamical sense of the results, 
you sure better do your statistics in that coordinate. Um, and that's often proved to be very difficult to do in the field. Um, the computational technology is Peter Sullivan's. Um, here's a picture of a snapshot. This is a flow field in which left to right there is a geostrophic flow in the three atmosphere. Um, and there is a specified wave field underneath that is a random realization of a spectrum fitted to measurements with different spectra for um, different wave ages. And you can, in this depiction of, of the, the velocity field to the right, certainly see the turbulent fluctuations. And you can also see that they, they have roots that reach down into the, 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 the shape of the, of the wave surfaces. And so clearly, these, these wave <coughs> components are having a very strong influence on the atmospheric flow above. And this is only about the lower third of the boundary layer, um, 150 meters up. You see the sort of surface correlations fading. You can look at that in, in a statistical way in these leftmost plots of the correlation of the velocities that are given the height above the surface. This coordinate zeta is this, this relative to the variable surface height coordinate. These are time average uh, correlation functions. Um, the colored stripes on the left are, are typical anemometer heights of, of measurement. And you're seeing four curves here in each case associated with the with four different wave ages. The ones near one are near wind wave equilibrium. You'll notice they have correlations near the surface that in fact are relatively weaker and very limited in their height and extent. And in particular, they're almost not present at anemometer heights, which means that so much of the observational quest for looking for wave influences in the atmosphere has been frustrated by the fact that if you're near wind wave equilibrium, you really ought to be a lot closer to the surface. But of course, that, that's observationally difficult. On the other hand, when you get to older waves, and as I'll show in a moment, the average state of the wave field in the ocean is old, um, somewhat like this one, um, that you, you see a much higher reach of the influence of what we call, again, wave-pumped winds, wave-correlated components of the flow field, as opposed to the rest of the fluctuations, which, will, which are incoherent with respect to waves, which we can call turbulence. On the right are some local snapshots. You both get a sense of, of the shape of the specified wave field, this random realization of the spectrum, and the structure of U and W. Um, relative to that, in particular, the correlation here, as predicted from wave pump wave theory, wind pump wave theory, is W and the HDT, which, by the way, is a statistic I've never seen calculated from observations. I think it should be. And the horizontal velocity with the height. And you, you again, can obviously see, see the relations. If you look at the form stress, which is this area integral of the pressure in the atmosphere at the surface against the slope of the sea surface um, here in the x direction, then this is an integral force. Um, and the sign convention is such that when it's a negative quantity, that means that the waves are dragging on the wind, which is, of course, is the usual expectation. And you can compute a co-spectrum of it in the wave number vector downwind in the direction of the wind and the, and the wind in the primary wave field. Um, and you see that for different wave ages, uh, you actually get this, this, this form stress distributed broadly across the spectrum. That is, this process of, of wave drag is, is a broad spectral property. Um, and you get a very interesting anomaly when you look at old waves, which is that when you go to the larger waves, you actually have wave-driven winds. The sign of this reverses. Um, and combined with the turbulent momentum fluxus, this, this is the, 
you know, the net drag, um, even for old waves, you still have a net drag on the atmosphere. On the other hand, you're, you're, you're forcing a lot of the fluctuations in the, the atmosphere in the larger um, scale component of the spectrum. Now let's look for critical layers. The picture on the right is one of the picture from Ken's group. And it is, um, as a function of time over many days, I think it must have been from Flip, um, and as a function of phase speed on, on the, the y-axis, this is a plot of the phase relation between um, the surface height and W at the anemometer height, the measurement height um, of the instrument. And the striking thing that you see is this strong shift in color, that is strong jump in phase, across this black line, which is interpreted as, as a critical error line. And so this is an indication of, of the presence of critical errors. There were earlier measurements by Christoph and Frehe that, that sort of showed the same thing, differently analyzed. And the bigger plot is from the large eddy simulation, the ones I've talked about. This for wind wave equilibrium, in which um, for, um, as a function of C, um, that is, as a function of weight number um, in, in the wave direction, here are the phase relations uh, to the surface of, of the vertical velocity and the horizontal velocity, and again, they, they show a jump, approximately, as you see visually in that picture. If you try to decompose this in a spectral way that is not being limited in the model by looking at the anemometer height, here is, as a function of C, again the wave number, phase for a bunch of curves that are in curves of um, increasing height above the sea surface. And each of those dots is the location where C equals U bar. Now, there's clearly a phase transition. Um, it's approximately in the vicinity of these uh, critical layers, the critical layers are moving closer and closer to the surface with slower waves, shorter waves. They're not exactly at the zero phase line. It turns out these critical layers have a structure that is not the idealized critical layer structure of a, of a normal mode. This is a turbulent flow. But this is a confirmation that even in a turbulent flow, this concept of critical layers being very crucially involved in the wind wave exchange is, is a quite a valid concept in spite of the presence of highly turbulent flows. <coughs> if you look in the left at mean wind profiles um, normalized by the friction velocity computed on the atmospheric side, um, you see in the black dots LES points, in the red line a best fit Mino Moniobokov to the outer part of the, of the layer, um, and you see that, that in the case of um, old waves, you have very significant departures from the Novikov structure, even up to a rather <coughs> substantial height above the surface. In the case of wind wave equilibrium, you don't see such striking departures, and in fact, it, it, if there are departures, they move so close to the surface that in fact some of the subgrid scale modeling techniques begin to interfere with the model answer, and so you don't quite know but if there is no Nino-Bakoff departure, it is clearly quite trapped close to the surface. On the right, for the two same two wave ages, are a mean momentum balance in the downwind direction in which the different curves, I mean, they're, they're all momentum fluxes normalized by friction velocity squared, which is the momentum flux stress. Um, the total is this rather simple curve decaying with height. That's the conveying of the momentum of this air sea interaction into the interior. But the colored curves are the different components. This is in this um, wave falling coordinate system, and so there is a, a pressure force uh, against these, these deformed surfaces all the way up um, until the, the blue curve essentially decays to zero. The, uh, <coughs> T sub F curve is the result of turbulent fluxes in the calculation, the U prime, W prime curve. The S is the 
subgrid scale model component of it, which is dominant near the surface. Um, and you, you see that with both wave ages, the, the total momentum flux is, is, is net negative. And you see this, this pressure flux is something whose sign changes um, when you go from equilibrium to, to old waves. Last topic on this, um, I took a different picture than someone showed earlier. This is from one of my Banner's papers. Mike was Ken's postdoc advisor. In a, in a way. Hmm? Or vice versa, whatever you want to say. Um, but these are laboratory experiments of breaking waves. Um, and photographs show, you know, individual profiles, sort of the, the difference between just beginning to break and fully breaking. And so some direct numerical simulations were done of this as well. Um, one of the important results is that breaking increases the drag, and so it clearly is, is an important part of the story. And here with some displacement, just so you can see the curves, are uh, red and blue profiles of the mean wind compared to a, a Moni Nobukov Boglair profile um, <clears throat> against the data points and particularly at the, the higher resolution, the solid curves, there's, there's pretty close agreement and so this is certainly, if nothing else, it's a kind of validation of the large eddy simulation <coughs> technique and certainly confirmation of, of the difference in the, the atmospheric profile that is made by, by the fact that the waves are breaking. So, I now want to change topics. Um, let's speed up a little. Um, this is another picture from the high-res experiment. Is this your picture, Rayna? Somebody's in this room, probably. Anyway, what you see very clearly in this, this picture off of, of Monterey, broadly speaking, is all these little foam debris lines that are the convergence lines of Langmuir circulations. And so it's an indication that Langmuir circulations are a very important part of the ocean boundary layer. And in fact, this has come to be called Langmuir turbulence. And at this point, this is more or less the understanding of um, the standard state of the ocean surface layer, wind driven surface layer, that is, it's not an Ekman layer, it's a linear turbulence layer. Um, here are some plots, they come from a paper by Belcher's group, of global reanalyses involving these wave average models and, of course, the meteorological reanalysis of the distribution of the so called Langmuir number defined next to the red letters, uh, ratio of the surface wind stress to the approximately surface Stokes drift, never mind how hard it is to define surface Stokes drift, um, square rooted by a tradition to match a, a previous conception of linear numbers devised for, for viscously dominated flows. And what you see with all these different curves, um, different time periods, um, different hemispheres, is that compared to the vertical dotted line, which is wind wave equilibrium value for this quantity, that the distribution is mostly in favor of old waves. That is, the rough idea being that when winds pick up, waves pick up faster than when winds go down and waves decay. And so in that sense, the as well is, is, is a common part of the story, but it definitely says that Langmuir turbulence is the common state of, of the ocean, and there are even hints you know, in the climate literature reading entrails um, that the waves are increasing faster than the winds, which of course sounds absurd, but climate change is coming and who knows where we'll end up. <coughs> so the framework here is what I'm calling WEC theory, wave effect on currents. It's call it a sub-branch of the very broad theory of wave current interaction and wave theories. It started with a seminal paper by Craig and Leibovich in 1976 
which had the essential vision as to how you do this kind of theory, but it was incomplete with respect to various influences. And it has evolved towards a completeness, um, in which I've participated, and that at sequence is, is reference to the papers that have been written since 2004 by other authors using different derivational techniques and coming up with essentially the same functional form of the equations which are, are written here. And these are asymptotic theories in small wave slope. Uh, that is, they essentially are applying to the spectrum, the peak of the wave spectrum components, not the, the breaking components. And they're built on a scale separation between the fast and even short time and space scales of waves relative to the currents that you wish to calculate by averaging over the waves. And schematically, here are equations for momentum, any material concentration, and the turbulent kinetic energy of the system, um, in which the little dots on the right-hand side denote all the things that are standard fluid dynamics, and the other terms denote extra added terms because of the presence of waves over which you're averaging. In the momentum equations, there's a Stokes-Coriolis force and a so-called Stokes-Vortex force. There is a, an acceleration that comes from the waves. That is, this is the breaking transmission of momentum. And there is possibly extra mixing in the upper ocean by turbulence excited by the breaking waves or waves dragging against the bottom or whatever. In the tracer concentration, there is extra vection by the Stokes drift plus extra mixing, and in the energy conservation equation, there is so-called Stokes production, extra production of, of turbulent kinetic energy because of the shear of the Stokes velocity, and then the energy input and, and the dissipation. Um, I think it, and this has been the basis of large eddy simulations for circulation models. At this point, these equations have been implemented in a number of different codes. I think there is approximate consensus that this is the form we want to work with. It seems to be surviving crude observational tests as they can be made. Um, there's one conspicuous dissenter in the field as to this theory. It is George Meller. Um, I think the consensus is he's probably made some derivational mistakes. Quite possibly a rebuttal paper will appear soon because he keeps republishing his papers. Um, but approximate convergence, and so we proceed with these equations. Another component is one that was developed directly with Ken, and he alluded to it in his remarks, which is that you, you take a conception of a breaker as something that has a certain canonical shape of the penetration of the momentum impulse and the rate of working, uh, associated with a breaker that is then progressively forward, those successive lines <coughs> successively times, penetrating a certain distance into the fluid. Um, and then you imagine a field of such breakers fitting PDFs of size and amplitude that randomly occur in random places, and that somehow the envelope is fitted to the known drag laws and energy exchange laws so that you get, in that sense, the consistent total out of, out of these individual impulses. And then it's put into individual equations like this. Um, and this is in contrast with, with what was a, a prior conception in which you, you didn't resolve the turbulent flows. You, you had a Reynolds average mean flow parameterization profile in which breaking waves were just imagined as a kinetic energy injection at the surface rather than sort of <coughs> space-time resolve. Um, these equations then are the basis of a lot of large eddy simulation work. Um, here are a couple of representative pictures. The one on the left is wind wave equilibrium. This is vertical velocity about 10 meters below the surface. And you see these ups and down lines that are essentially the Langmuir circulation lines associated with surface convergence. They penetrate with some shape changes all the way through the boundary layer, so, so they become the dominant vertical flux agents in this flow. 
And on the right, just sort of for exotica, is what happens if you imagine there's a, in addition to the local wind sea, there's a strong remote swell such that your triangular angular number is substantially reduced. And now you get a very different flow organization, very much larger scale coherent structures. These have not been seen in the field. I'm not quite sure how you look for them. It would have to be some sort of a surface pattern analysis. But certainly the suggestion that, that swell makes a big difference, and as we saw in the previous distribution, um, swell is the typical state of, of, I mean, Langer turbulence and old waves, swell is the typical state of the ocean. Now, there are a lot of differences between Langer turbulence and, call it Ekman layer turbulence, shear turbulence. They're sort of briefly enumerated here. But essentially, it's a much more energetic and flux efficient in training type of turbulence than is shear turbulence. Um, you know, arguably competitive in its turbulent efficiencies with convective turbulence. Now as the last topic, um, I want to shift to something that is really quite new. Um, the surface ocean is full of you know, wind-driven currents and boundary layer turbulence and surface wave <coughs> motion. But it is also, as has become clear in about the last decade, let's say, very full of sub-mesoscale flow patterns whose typical scales are um, you know, kilometers horizontally, time scales hours to days, and vertical structures sort of strongly related to the surface weakly stratified mixed layer. Um, they're basically formed by phylogenetic processes, so they are analogs of atmospheric fronts. And they are all, all these ingredients are coexisting together, and so the question becomes what happens because of that conjunction as opposed to conceptions in which they're more, more isolated. They are approximately momentum balanced in the sense of, you know, in the extreme case, geostrophic balance. Um, they have Rossby numbers sort of order one or larger, so they're, they're not ge simple geostrophic flows. They take their energy from the mesoscale flow and in many instances pass it down in scale to smaller scale flows, so they are, just like internal waves, another agent of forward cascade to dissipation in the ocean. They have large vertical fluxes in the surface layer, buoyancy flux in particular, a restratifying buoyancy flux, so a typical storm cycle in the ocean is that a storm will have strong turbulence and mix up the boundary layer very well. The storm will go away, never mind if there's any sun, the sub mesoscale motions will begin to reestablish a, a, a vertical stratification. There's one way you can think about them approximately, not in an evolutionary sense, but in a kind of diagnostic instantaneous state sense, that they have a very simplified horizontal momentum equation and, of course, continuity mass balance, which is written here, which is really nothing more than the combination of the Ekman layer components and thermal wind, with the vertical eddy viscosity being a contribution from the boundary of the turbulence. If you take the point of view that sub mesoscale fronts or filaments, that is density extrema, as opposed to density steps, or coherent vortices, have a signature in the buoyancy field, and there is turbulent mixing, then this is a set of equations that you can use to calculate the associated circulation. If you have a front, um, you know, there's going to be an almost geostrophic flow along the front, you know, across the gradient. But in addition, there's going to be a secondary circulation associated with the vertical mixing. And as I'll show you in a moment, that secondary circulation is typically frontogenetic. So these ingredients alone, once you have something like a frontal structure, will lead to further frontogenesis. Um, and so let's try to follow that. So, just along the left, let's look at the initial condition first. This turns out to be an initial condition for a large edge simulation. 
um, in which the flow is sort of tricked to be fully developed actin layer turbulence in the presence of a, a, a nudged surface temperature structure or two-dimensional two temperature structure, which is the top line. So it's a filament. It, it's colder. It's a colder temperature line, you know, several kilometers wide. The along <coughs> axis flow is geostrophic because it's a filament. It's a double jet. Um, and the cross-axis flow is surface convergence, um, central downwelling, and um, outward flow near the bottom of the boundary layer. And this, just to think of the convergence, this is frontogenetic to sharpen the gradients of the temperature field and, and the along axis velocity. Um, now, frontogenesis is an old subject in the atmosphere. It's basically been understood since 1972 with the work of Hoskins and Bretherton, that if it's frontogenesis induced by a strain and, and you assume that there's a degree of approximate force balance in it, um, that it will reach a finite time singularity. Um, now, most people with who do fluids don't think they're singular. Um, there's a mathematical prize to prove they aren't. No one has yet. Um, but what stops frontogenesis from reaching a catastrophe of infinite gradients? The plot on the right is a plot four hours later of the long axis, long filament axis flow. And as you can see, the central scale has shrunk enormously. And so frontogenesis has happened. This is a time of peak frontal strength. The fact that it goes no farther means that there's frontal rest. Here are time series of certain peak quantities in this evolution here over almost half a day. And the red curve is the vertical vorticity, that is the cross frontal gradient of the along front flow um, as a function of time starting from a rather small value of essentially order one relative to Coriolis parameter, that's typical Rossby number one sub mesoscale stuff. And within the four hours that I've named, it reaches a peak vorticity that is nearly 100. Um, that is, it's become an extremely strong flow from a rotational dynamics point of view, and thereafter declines. The black curve is the vertical velocity, the downwelling in the center. It shows a similar behavior of, of intensification and the decline. The bottom curve is the turbulent kinetic energy in the central region. And it shows more than an order of magnitude increase due to this from Genesis. If you look at the momentum flux balance at the time of peak from Genesis from arrest, then there are these three colored curves that are the three components of momentum flux in the top. And the blue curve is the, is the secondary circulation, turbulent thermal wind, that is the frontogenetic agent, the primary frontogenetic agent. The orange curve, no, the red curve is the cross frontal momentum flux that at this time has grown to the point where its gradient is strong enough to balance the secondary circulation from Genesis. The orange curve is Stokes vortex force. And it is an equal contributor to the momentum balance of this arrested front. That is, this wave current interaction is you know, absolutely central in the <coughs> approximately wind wave equilibrium case um, to the way that this front develops and, and is arrested. Here's a plot of that momentum flux covariance on all three components. You see that it is the black horizontal one that ends up being dominant. That is the traditional vertical fluxes of the turbulent boundary layer, um, you know, although they, you know, they're not trivial and they start sort of bigger, um, certainly don't end up dominating this arrest process. You'll notice the covariance hangs around all the time. That is, this front once arrested still has the secondary circulation trying to sharpen it, has the turbulence trying to uh, 
um, widen it. It's really, it's not a normal boundary layer turbulence. It's essentially a submesoscale, small submesoscale turbulence. Here's a picture of it, um, sort of just a little after the peak of the front genesis, the vertical velocity, the long front, and the, the covariance a little below the surface. You see you're developing a meandering. This is indicative of a horizontal shear instability, just like a classical laboratory shear layer, except not like a classical laboratory shear layer. Large scale structures in the long front direction, that is many hundreds of kilometers, I mean, meters wide. On the other hand, the frontal width is essentially about 100 meters, that is comparable to the boundary layer scale. And so the whole frontal arrest process is first of all, the frontal genesis is being driven by the boundary layer turbulence here, given the existence of some mesoscale structure. The frontal arrest is this instability of that frontal structure when it gets so sharp that the instability growth rate is bigger than the frontal genesis growth rate. And this, I think, is the start of a whole new wonderful era of upper ocean physics. And so here are my final remarks that don't say anything I haven't already said. And with all honor to Ken, he's been a valuable partner in some parts of this, particularly in our work, the critical layers and the breaking ways. And uh, happy birthday. <laughs>